Welcome back to Crux Stationalis. Today we explore the Roman Station Church for the Tuesday after the third Sunday of Lent, the Basilica di Santa Pudenziana. Today I present to you the apse mosaic of this Basilica of Santa Pudenziana. It is truly one of the most ancient and most beautiful witnesses of the mystery of the church. Why is that? It is one of the most ancient apsidal mosaics of the church. It dates from the years 410 and 417. But why are these dates the precise dates that we look at? That's because 410 was the year of the first sack of Rome, when the Visigoths entered the city. It was one of the moments, let's say, truly dramatic for the Romans, because it signified the end of the Roman Empire, or at least, as we could say, the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire, its demise coming 50 years later in the year 460, the official date of the end of the Western Roman Empire. But why is this date important? On the occasion of the sack of Rome, St. Augustine wrote that the city of Rome has ended. It has been replaced by the city of God. The city of God has a particular characteristic. There are persons, that is, subjects with rights. It is filled with people who all have rights, not like that of Rome where it was only the citizens who had particular rights. But in the city of God, this principle of persons subjects having rights, now belongs to all men, because they are persons made in the image of God. Saint Augustine made an incredible revelation, that which we find in the Nicene Constantinople Creed from the year 381, just 30 years before this mosaic was made. We know the greatest mystery of our faith, the doctrine of the mystery of the Holy Trinity, that God is one, that he is three persons, that the Holy Trinity is three persons in one God. We owe this application of the term person to St. Augustine. If you look at the Greek of the creed, you don't find the word person, prosopon, but we find the word hypostasis. Why did St. Augustine use the word person for hypostasis? In doing so, he set the foundation for Western society, the person, the individual, we have seen this in recent decades when popes have emphasized the Christian roots of Europe, of Western society, emphasizing the importance of the person, that all persons are subjects of rights. Where did this principle originate from? In one way, we can say it was born here with this mosaic. We can say it was born with the words of St. Augustine concerning the city of God. And we find a contrast, for example, between the East and the West. In the East, the good of the community is counted as more important than the goods of an individual. The concept doesn't exist that the single person, that the single individual is the subject of inalienable rights, that is, a person, as understood in Roman law and which created the basis of Western thought. It is very important. We talk about a crisis of the West. This is what is at stake this principle which underlies Western order. We set the mosaic between the years 410 and 417 because we have the sack of Rome and Augustine's concept of the city of God, and we have the death of Innocent I in the year 417. And with this mosaic, we see a representation of the city of God. It was restored in the year 2000 for the Jubilee year, and because of this, now we have the ability to see more clearly the beauty and brilliance of the mosaic. This mosaic at Santa Pudenciana, in the center we see Christ the Pantocrator, which will be taken up in Byzantine iconography. So Christ the King sits in the center with all the saints around him. But we must remember, Byzantine mosaics are from the 9th century, from the 800s and following. This mosaic is from the 5th, from the 400s. So how is it that the author of this mosaic, whom we do not know, represented Christ as king of the universe? He did it in this way, putting Christ in the dress of the Roman emperor, and the apostles sitting around Christ are vested in senatorial garb. But we must make a distinction. In the 19th century, works were done on the mosaic, and the apostles and the woman on the right side of the mosaic, that is, to Christ's left, 
were redone. All is new save the face of Peter, and the garments have been completely modified, losing the distinctive dress we see on the left side of the mosaic of the apostles dressed as senators. Nonetheless, we have an idea which is genius in this mosaic. In the city of God, Christ sits in the center, with the apostles around him. The mosaic translates the ancient structure of Rome to the city of God, to the ecclesial structure. And not only this, in the background we see a cross upon a hill. That hill is Calvary. The cross is that which Constantine put upon Calvary, the victorious golden and jeweled cross of Christ. This cross will also be found at Santa Polinarius in Classe in Ravenna, but that cross is Byzantine. Four centuries afterwards, they took the image from this mosaic. And the city which sits around the hill of Calvary in this mosaic is Jerusalem. But it is the Constantinian Jerusalem. Since Jerusalem had been destroyed with the destruction of the temple in the year 70, and Constantinian's Jerusalem would also be destroyed. So it is here that might be found the only witness of Constantine's Jerusalem. And it is a Jerusalem with golden rooftops. What city must it be, that one with golden rooftops, with Christ sitting in the center with golden robes? And in the sky we see the images of four animals, hearkening to the book of Revelation, with its prophecy of the destruction of Rome, something which was almost unimaginable since Rome was in its greatest splendor. However, Rome becomes surmounted by the city of God. It was sacked and its glory vanished. But as St. Augustine said, Rome has ended. It had been replaced by the city of God. In this mosaic, for the first time, we find the symbols of the apocalypse. That is, the four animals of the apocalypse in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem with golden rooftops. This symbolism is beautiful, but we also see the beautiful symbols of the two women crowning Saints Peter and Paul. If the original symbolism is to be maintained of the heavenly Jerusalem of the church as a city of God, if we maintain the imperial symbols, these two women are not Saints Persede and Pudenciana, the daughters of Senator Pudens, but rather we know these two women to represent images of the Vestal Virgins who would crown generals after victorious military campaigns. Translated theologically, they would be the Church of the Jews and the Church of the Gentiles. Those two peoples who became the objects, respectively, of Saints Peter's and Paul's preaching, the two generals of the city of God, generals of Christ. These two witnesses, as the book of Revelation calls Saints Peter and Paul, these two witnesses were housed here in the house of Senator Pudens, a Roman senator. His house became the first Domus Ecclesia, the first domestic church, wherein Saints Peter and Paul were hosted. After the Edict of Milan in the year 313, when Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity, this structure, which were baths, were transformed into a basilica. The house church, however, still remained. And that is why we see written in the scroll in the mosaic in Christ's hand, Dominus Conservator Ecclesiae Pudenciane, the Lord preserved the church of Pudens, that is, the house church of Pudens. This basilica holds the memory of the apostles. We see Christ, we see the apostles, but what about the church, the people of God? A beautiful analogy is found here. The tessere, the tiles of the mosaic, represent the church as a whole. This is something fundamental to this mosaic and all Byzantine mosaics. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the mystical body is like a mosaic, which represents the risen Christ where each Christian is a tessera. The tessere of a mosaic, each one is different from the other. But just like a mosaic, if a tessera falls and what remains is a whole, so if one of us doesn't live his Christian vocation, it is like in the mystical body of Christ, a whole exists. And that tile cannot be replaced. We have seen the result of trying to replace mosaic tessere, and it's not good. It isn't possible. We cannot substitute an authentic tessera, an authentic vocation, because a copy will never satisfy. 
And so we come to this church, this first church of Rome, where St. Peter himself lived and celebrated the sacred mysteries. And we are confronted with the examine to live our Christian vocation to the full. Some vocations are golden, some vocations are blue, green, red. But the importance is the presence of that person, made in the image of God, that tessera shining and adding to the fullness of the mosaic, without whom something would be missing. A consolation for all of you, for me. Another reminder that we have today to live our Christian life. And in doing so, we make shine the testament of the mystical body of Christ in the world. And for that we will be judged at the end of our lives, for the love with which our vocation shined, for the beauty you add to the church, for the beauty I add to the church. That is what matters.